no longer let our members or our body become instruments of unrighteousness. The obviously, the obviously member we can think about here is the tongue. What should come out of our mouth now is blessings, whereas before but it may have been dirty jokes, unrighteous conversations and hatred and, and all the negative things. Now, of course, our members are instruments of righteousness. What comes out now is blessings. What comes out now are, uh, is to, are positive things, so to promote the kingdom of God. Even in times of stress, even in times when we're oppressed, uh, uh, facing the enemy, facing oppression, it's always our members are instruments of righteousness. That's what happens when we are fully yielded to God. Okay. Amen. So we must make sure that our members, our bodily parts, are dedicated to God's service and glorifies Him. Okay, so with this in mind, we've got a little prayer exercise. Okay. That will demonstrate the putting to death of the flesh and the revival to our lives by the Holy Spirit. And if you go to Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verse 16 through to verse 20. Imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Okay. And the final verse says, verse 20 here, My son, keep thy father's commandments, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Okay. So, the six things yes, seven of Revelation, proud look, lying son, hands that shed innocent blood. A heart devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to to evil, a false witness who speaks by his as a liar, and one who sows discord on the brother, a troublemaker, a stirrer, a gossiper, yeah, because cause him trouble. So, notice here the body parts that I mentioned, that the writer relates them, it's, it's, it's all to do with parts of the body. Okay. Now, we should have a diagram, a diagram of a, 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 a man or a person. Have that diagram, uh, let's see. Do we have this? Okay, right. So let's, let's look at this. This is like a, a, a prayer exercise. Okay. Let's talk about the whole person here. So we've got this, this human uh, here. So the lying tongue, okay? And here, We've got little prayers for each one of them, okay? For, for, for the tongue, for the look, for the heart, okay? For the hands that shed innocent blood, for the feet that are swift in running to evil, okay? So we've got these, these things here, okay? So let's look at the tongue. We know the tongue, of course, is very powerful. We have that discourse in James, where the brilliant discourse by James about the tongue and how the tongue, even though it's such a small member and seems so significant, it is so powerful. I, in my own uh, personal life, have seen the powerful effects of the tongue. You know, I work in a school. I've seen the effects of bullying, you know, verbal bullying, verbal uh, insulting, uh, and see the devastation uh, it's had in you know, one particular instance on the students who was mercilessly you know, verbally abused and ended up trying to take their own life because of it. The victim, uh, a gang of you know, a whole gang of 20 odd children you know, against this one show. And, uh, so we can see the power, you know, witness it firsthand, the power, the tongue is a very, very powerful thing. Okay. So it talks about here that the lying tongue, one of the things that the Lord hates. And we have the power to kill our brother and our sister from 
we saw him last year, so. so so we need to pray that the Lord be in control of our tongues. So we have to say, I've got to pray here, Lord, I repent of dishonesty and lies. Lord, put to death in me all that contributes to dishonesty. By your spirit, revive in me honesty and truth. So let my tongue always speak honesty and truth. We look at the proud look. And again, the idea of pride. The Lord says, the proud I know are far off. And you know, our face betrays our emotions. <laughs> Without us even realizing it, we can look at a situation or see some people or someone says something to us and straight away without us even realizing it we can react in our face and someone say wow did you see the look on his face what did you look at that for you know yeah you did you know <laughs> because you, you, <laughs> and you're all laughing because you, you're going you to uh, appreciate that you know but sometimes we can be like that oh, i remember we had a friend um, and we were witnessing to her and uh, we had another christian friend not from our church and we introduced our christian friend this unbelieving friend who were trying to win to the Lord. And um, after we introduced him, they had a discussion and she, they went away. And the unbeliever said to me, your friend, she calls herself a Christian, she said, but she judged me. I said, what do you mean? And he said, you look, she gave me, she looked me up and down, because you know, she was an unbeliever, she's dressed in and out, you know, as a, 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 a way of the world. And she had really any clothes on and stuff like that. But she said, she looked at me and she judged me. I saw it in her face. Thought, wow. And all the work that my wife and I had been doing with this lady was undone. Because a fellow Christian came and gave her the look. And I don't even think that the Christian friend that we'd introduced had even realised she'd done it, but she had. That look is so important. You know, we, you know, our, our, and our, our looks, our face betrays our emotions. So we have to be very careful. So we talk about here the proud look. So we have to repent of that. Lord, I repent of the look of pride. My facial expressions, my, my demeanor, Lord, I would pray you be in control. And if you go to Philippians chapter 4, it talks about what sort of things are good, what sort of things are honest, pure, true, good reports. If you know, think on these things, that's about our spiritual attitude. If you have the right, the right spiritual attitude, that will come out in our facial expression. So instead of being condemnatory, instead of having the proud look, it'll be love, it'll be compassion. Sort of so we have to say, Lord, by your spirit, revive in me an attitude of humility. And that could be hard for us sometimes, being humble. Yeah. God demands humility from us. You know, the, the greatest leader, I believe, uh, humanity has ever produced was Moses. You might be surprised, but I believe Moses was, was one of the greatest leaders, apart from Jesus, that uh, you know, we, 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 history has ever seen. Because Moses, he led was it four million people for over 40 years, yeah. and longer, you know, uh, and uh, brought them out of oppression into the promised land. Although he himself didn't was able to go in. But what did God serve Moses? There was none meek as Moses in all the earth. Yeah. Because of his humility, he was a great leader. If we're going to be great leaders, we have to be humble people. Humility. But we have to, Lord, revive in me an attitude of humility. Revival comes when we humble ourselves before God. That's what the Bible says. If my people who are called by my name shall what? First thing to do, humble themselves. Humility. And so the proud look has to go. The, the I'm best of you, I'm superior. It's got to be humble. It's got to be humility. Winston Churchill, the great wartime British Prime Minister, was once asked, what does it take to be a great leader? And he said, to be a great leader, you must first learn to be a great servant. Uh, Winston Churchill said that. And he said, I learned to be a servant at the boys' school I attended. When Winston Churchill was at the boys' school, he went to Harrow Boys' School, a very rich school for rich children. We call it posh school. And, and, in, and Harrow School had a very harsh system in those days. That was in the late 19th century, where the older boys were allowed to beat the younger boys. So when Winston Churchill first went to the school, of course, he's one of the younger boys. And he used to get beaten yeah, uh, by the older boys. And the younger boys would have to be servants to the older boys. They have to clean the rooms, clean their shoes, 
uh, make sure that books were all up to date and everything. The younger boys had to do that for the older boys, and if the rooms weren't clean, then the boy who was responsible to clean that room would be beaten by the older boy. This was the, 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 the hierarchy they had at Harrow. And when you read Winston Churchill's memoirs, he talks about this. And one day, one of the boys gave him a thorough beating because he didn't clean his room out properly or whatever it was. And Winston Churchill, very angry, looked at the boy in the face, the big older boy who was beating him. And he said, one day, because when I grow up, I'm going to be a greater man than you. And the boy said, just for that, I'm going to give you six more. And he had a cane and he whacked him six more times. But you know, when Winston Churchill grew up, that boy that beat him was one of his ministers. Okay? The boy that beat him was a man called Lord Halifax. And Lord Halifax actually became an ambassador. Winston Churchill sent him to Washington to be the British ambassador. So <laughs> you look at that. You know? But <laughs> Churchill said, I learned to be a good leader by being a good servant. And it was tough at times. But in that school, I learned what it was like to serve. To be a great leader, you have to be great servants. Anyway, let's move on to time is moving on. A heart that devises wicked plans. That's we're talking about how, you know, the emotional sense, not our physical beating heart, but our inner man, our inner consciousness. Okay? We must devise wicked plans. Even simple scheming and plotting, we must repent of that. Lord, I repent of harboring grudges and offences in my heart. People upset us, uh, and we may be wronged, and we may be the right, but you know, we have to put it to one side uh, and don't harbour the grudge. So by your spirit, revive in me a heart that forgives. Oh, that's so key, having a forgiving heart. You know, unforgiveness can keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus gave that uh, parable of the unjust or the unforgiving steward. You know, Christ forgave us, and look at the price he paid. And he says, what other people have done to us? Nothing compared to what, I've, what you've done to me. You know, I believe I've forgiven you, so you in turn have to forgive. So we have to have an attitude of forgiveness, and that needs to be revived in us. Okay. So revive in me a heart that forgives and is tender. Put in me a heart that devises good towards others. Okay, hands that shed innocent blood. Again, it is a praying repentance. Lord, I repent of tearing others down and killing them with my hand, with my words. Well, not physically kill with our hands, but with our words. As I said earlier, we can kill. So by your spirit, revive me in love and grace. Help me to build up others, to put my hands to work for good and not evil. So doing things for other people, okay, helping them, do doing things on jobs, that sort of thing, when you see a need to fulfill the need, is building up the kingdom of God. That's what we need to be doing. And finally, feet that are swift in running to evil. Again, Lord, I repent of being so quick to turn to sin. For being enticed so easily, we should turn away from sin, we turn away from evil. So by your spirit, revive in me a faithfulness to good and righteous living. I want to be quick to love, to forgive, and to be gentle. Now, this speaks of the whole person. He that soweth discord among the brethren, the person that brings disunity. And we, we, and unfortunately, we get them in, in the church, the enemy comes in and he will put little things in people's hearts, in people's mouths, and it will cause a division. And Satan knows that the, the, the greatest weapon he can bring to the church is discord, because a church that is not united is ineffective. So he does his best to sow discord among the brethren. So we have to repent and pray this prayer, Lord, if I'm guilty of it, then I repent of promoting disunity with my attitude and actions towards others. So all the things like gossiping and, and storytelling, that has to, you know, we repent of that. That's not, that's not kingdom-mindedness. So by your spirit, Lord, revive in me a love for others and an attitude that speaks, that seeks peace and promotes unity. So all, all these, these things, so we can apply these, you see, to scripture here in Proverbs. Okay? All these things that we, we need to, to repent of. And we might think, well, this doesn't apply to me. But actually, if we are looking uh, into the Word of God and look at the Word of God as a mirror and stand against it and look at it very closely, we can see in our lives something you know, in each of these that we are guilty of. Because none of us are perfect. We are a work in progress, as my wife always says. 
you know, don't look at me uh, and expect me to be perfect uh, you know, as a pastor or as a leader you know, uh, and uh, uh, whatever office we hold. We are none of us perfect. We need every day to repent. So Paul says, I die daily. Take my cross, says, I die daily. Every morning when I wake up, I have to repent. Yeah. Every evening I come in from work and I have my time with God, I have to pray a prayer of repentance. Even if I'm not aware I haven't done anything wrong, I still repent. If I can't think of anything wrong, I, 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 I pray a prayer of repentance for my nation. I repent for the people that I've met who are sinners. You know, we have to be uh, uh, people of repentance, because that's what the Bible says. Humbling ourselves calls for repentance. If my people are called by my name, the first condition is humble themselves. Okay. Turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance. And again, just, uh, as I said before, he's talking about my people, not the sinners, but my people. Praise the Lord. So, so let's conclude then. When Christians are revived, they live more consistently. They make their homes more holy and more happy. Now this leads to the ungodly to envy them. And that's very true. Uh, people ask, why are you so happy? Why are you so content? Why does nothing phase you? Sometimes things are phasing us and sometimes deep down they can. But they don't see that because we have the peace of Jesus Christ, the peace of God in us. Yeah. Why? Because we have been revived. So it means that we can live consistently. Our homes, our neutral homes, are happy, holy, calm, peaceful places. Uh, we've had that before. We, you know, when my children were younger, we used to have their school friends come over for tea, they call it, we have dinner. They come over after school, you know, so and so come for tea, and you know, they come and have shared evening meal with us. And then quite often would remark, oh, your home is so peaceful. Oh, your home seems so happy. One other thing was, was quite often asked, how come your parents never swear? You know, they used to their parents swearing, you know, our language in the home as part of the vocabulary. You know, that was said a few times. I've never heard a swear word in my house. It's, it's such a nice atmosphere, such a happy, you know, they notice that there's a difference. Why is that? Because of the revival of the Holy Ghost, because of the Holy Spirit living in us. So our homes are happy homes. They're homes where Jesus Christ lives. They're homes where the Holy Spirit invades and has a presence there. And so are the ungodly coming in, even their children, witnessing their experience. It's a witness to them. Okay? And this leads people to, yes, envy us, okay? but also to inquire after us. Inquire. What is the difference? What is it that you've got? What is it in your home that's not in mine? What is it that your mum and dad have that they don't swear at each other and they always argue that in my house they do? How is it that your mum and dad have been married for how many years and mine are divorced? All these questions are asked when people come into a godly home where people are revived and living to God. <clears throat> and I close with a quote by Charles Spurgeon, a famous, uh, uh, well known English uh, uh, preacher from the 19th century, he says, when Christians are revived, they live more consistently, they make their homes more holy and more happy. This leads the ungodly to envy them and to inquire after their secret. And that's a secret. Yeah. It's being revived. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we've finished there. Now, if anybody has any questions, then feel free to ask if anything you've understood, anything you've missed out on the sheets as we're going along. Uh, now it's just opportunity. No, you're okay, everything okay. Excellent. Brilliant. Is that a third person we had joining us that crept in quietly there? In the office? Hello? No. She's second year. Sorry, a second year. Oh, right. She's not listening now. No. <laughs> oh, oh, right. Okay. She's not listening. I thought she was. <laughs> okay. Right, so Sister Zion and Sister Samantha, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, and I guess we'll be speaking uh, on the 29th of September again for lesson two. But I pray that everything's been okay, everything's been clear, been blessed. Okay, so Father, thank you for the lesson today. I just pray that what we've discussed and what we've learned, what we've learned in the scripture, will be implanted as a seed in our hearts. And just pray that this will be useful and help our sisters in their walk with you to help them build up and grow in your knowledge and grace. We pray this in the name 
of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you guys both from Glasgow Church? No, I'm from Exeter. Exeter? Yeah. Wow. Long way. Oh, so, oh, so you're, you're, you're back to Scotland from Exeter? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what about you, Sister Zion? Norway. Norway. So you're in Norway? Oh, wow. International. Okay, the, the wonders of modern technology, eh? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much indeed, guys, and God bless. In Jesus' name. Okay, okay, until next time. Bye.